A bloody murder scene. A married couple brutally attacked with an axe as they slept. The husband was killed. The wife somehow survived, but was scarred for life. And did she recognize the killer? Some thought it was the mob, some thought a serial killer, and some even suspected the couple's own son. But could a son really do this to his own parents? On the 15th of November 2004, a 52-year-old clerk for an appeals judge named Peter Porco and his wife, a children's speech pathologist named Joan Porco, were asleep in their bed at their home in Del Mar, New York. An intruder crept into the home and made their way into the couple's bedroom. Here, the intruder struck Peter with an axe 16 times and struck Joan three times. <laughs> When Peter didn't show up for work, colleagues became concerned. It wasn't like Peter to skip work. An officer was called to check out the home, and when the officer arrived, he immediately saw signs of trouble. The door was ajar with the key still in the lock. There was blood on the ground, and when the officer entered the home, he saw even more blood. He then saw a body lying on the ground. It was the body of Peter Porco. The officer then made his way upstairs, into the couple's bedroom, and into a bloodbath. Joan was in the bed covered in blood, and the axe which had been used in the attack, and belonged to the family, was also in the bedroom. Incredibly, Joan was still alive, but only barely. She was immediately rushed to hospital. Joan had been struck three times, and Peter 16. But why was Peter's body found downstairs, if he had been attacked in his bed. Apparently, some time after the attack, Peter managed to regain consciousness. The top part of Peter's brain, which is known as the neocortex, which controls higher functions such as language, was damaged. Yet the paleocortex, underneath the neocortex, which is responsible for primal instincts and second nature habits, was still intact. So when Peter regained consciousness, he remarkably went about his normal morning routine. He made breakfast, tried to fill the dishwasher, he even went outside to fetch the morning newspaper. The front door must have locked behind him, and he grabbed the spare key underneath the plant pot to open it. Then lost consciousness due to blood loss and died. It appeared as though Peter was the main target of the attack because he was struck so many times compared to Joan, and there was nothing taken from the home. Before Joan was taken to surgery, an investigator who knew the family asked Joan if she could hear him. She couldn't speak but nodded yes. The investigator then asked if she knew who had done this. Again, she nodded yes. The investigator asked if her son, Christopher, had done this. And again, Joan nodded yes. Peter and Joan had two sons. 23-year-old Jonathan Porco was a lieutenant in the US Navy serving on a nuclear submarine hundreds of miles away. Their other son, 21-year-old Christopher Porco, attended the University of Rochdale in New York, a three-hour drive away from Peter and Joan's home. Christopher had found himself in trouble before. He had forged documents to take out loans to pay for his tuition, as well as buy himself a new yellow Jeep. And when his father found out, he confronted him about it in an email. Peter expressed his disappointment in his son, and told him that if he ever did anything like this again, he would be forced to file a forgery affidavit. Peter ended the email by saying, We may be disappointed with you, but your mother and I still love you and care about your future. It was discovered that Peter and Joan had life insurance worth over $1 million. 
It was also discovered that Peter had burgled his parents' home back in July of 2003, and stolen a laptop which he then sold on eBay. And eight months earlier, in November 2002, Christopher had stolen another laptop as well as a computer. And one month before the attack, Christopher had his eBay account frozen. He had not sent several customers their items, and had emailed those customers posing as his own brother, claiming Christopher had died, and was unable to deliver the items. Peter was now the main suspect. When Joan got out of surgery and regained consciousness, she claimed to have no memory of the investigator asking her if her son Christopher had done this, and she had no memory of ever nodding yes. Christopher denied being at the family home that night, and even let police take a DNA sample from him, and let the police look at his body to show he had no bruises or any signs of struggle anywhere on him. And when police searched Peter's yellow jeep, they found no evidence that he was there the night of the murder. There was no blood in the jeep, and there was no blood on any of Chris's clothes. There were no fingerprints found on the axe either. So if Christopher did not commit the murder, then who did? Police learned that Peter Porco had once received a death threat from a man who lost custody of his children in a case before the New York State Supreme Court. The man told Peter he was going to get a gun and kill him. The local newspaper had also received a letter sent from someone claiming to be Peter's killer. Peter Porco was not even a challenge. Once I got inside, I repeatedly hit him in the head and neck with a small axe I brought with me. I ignored all his pleading screams, also I beat Joan Porco, but unfortunately she survived. If you ever want to find me, you want to stop going after easy suspects, show me some respect I deserve. Catch me if you can. The person who wrote the letter also took credit for another local murder, and put out a warning that he would kill again. Peter Porco also had a relative who was involved in organised crime, serving time for loan sharking. He was known as Frankie the Fireman. It was asked if he could have been involved, after all it was a fireman's axe that was used in the attack. But when investigators learned that Christopher Porco had gone to a financial counsellor just before the murder, looking for investment advice, and claiming that he was about to receive millions of dollars from a relative, Christopher once again became the number one suspect. Investigators then checked the alarm, which had been smashed on the night of the attack. However, it was not the smashing of the alarm which deactivated it, someone had entered the alarm code. The phone line had also been cut. Christopher claimed on the night of the attack that he was at the university campus over 100 miles away. So the investigators checked all the security cameras from all the major highways between the campus and the family home, checking to see if they could see Chris's yellow jeep. At 10.30pm, they saw a yellow jeep leave the university campus. It was 2.14am when the alarm at the family home was deactivated, and it was 4.59am when the phone line was cut, and the yellow jeep returned to the university campus at 8.30am. It was looking increasingly likely that Christopher was the attacker. Police had to make sure this was Chris's yellow jeep though if they wanted this evidence to hold up in court. And although the images from the security cameras didn't pick up the license plate or the driver, they did pick up other things. The passenger door had mud on it, the passenger side window had a torn parking sticker, and there was also a sticker on the back tyre cover. And when police compared photos taken of Chris's Jeep the day of the murder, the mud stain, the torn sticker, and the sticker on the back tyre cover all matched up. Sadly though, the toll booth that they thought Chris used didn't have any security cameras, but when investigators asked toll collectors if they recalled seeing a yellow jeep that night, one worker said she did remember seeing a vehicle matching that description, but unfortunately for police, she couldn't remember anything about the driver. The worker said the vehicle would have come in around 11pm just before she got off work, and that only a handful of cars went through at that time. So, investigators collected the tickets that were handed into the toll booth around that time, and of the 12 tickets collected, the forensic lab found one of the tickets had Christopher Porco's DNA on it. This, along with the jeep being seen leaving campus and arriving back on campus around 10 hours later, proved that Chris had enough time 
to drive to his parents' home, commit the murder, and get back in time. Christopher was charged with the murder of Peter Porco and the attack of his mother, Joan Porco. Joan, though, having no memory of ever nodding yes to the question of did her son do this, came out in support of her son. People in support of Chris claimed he couldn't have done this because he was a kind and gentle man, and they pointed out that if he had done this, why did he not have any blood on his clothes? If he did wear something to protect his clothes from the blood, then where was that? A year after the attack, Christopher Porco went on trial, with his mother, whose face had been surgically repaired, standing by his side the whole way through. The jury found Christopher Porco guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years in prison. Still to this day, his mother believes his innocence, and Christopher also still claims to be innocent. <laughs>